You're listening to Creek Peaks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast, episode number 187. Creep Geeks Guide to the Paranormal, Shadow People 101, Neanderthals are Wimps, and Spy Seeds. Yeah. So here we are. Welcome again back to the Creep Peaks Podcast. If you're a, a repeat offender, we very much appreciate having you here listening with us today. And if you're not welcome, <laughs> as in, you know, if you're not welcome, not you're not welcome. Okay. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Okay. So we thought we'd do something a little bit different with this particular episode of the Creep Peaks Podcast. This is our 187th episode so far that you may or may not have heard. And if you have, you probably heard it somewhere like Apple iHeartRadio, SoundCloud. What's some other ones? The Googles. Yeah. yeah. Google, Google Podcast, Google Play Music, all of that sort of thing. So pretty much anywhere you can listen to a podcast, you can listen to ours. And if you do, we appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. So I'm your host, Greg. I'm Omi. And we're going to talk about some stuff that we think to be interesting. And what we decided to do is do a little Creep Geeks Guide to the Paranormal and we figured we'd start off with shadow people. Now, what this actually is, is just kind of a brief overview of what we think these things to be. So, we figured we'd do shadow uh, people and then talk about some other stuff in the news. Because we are Creep Peaks Paranormal and Weird News Podcast. Sure. So, uh, if you'd like to share or if you have something you'd like to share with us to maybe talk about on a podcast or just something you want to share in general, we do have a phone number for you. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yeah. And by sharing, it helps us. Yeah. So we do appreciate it. So if you have a comment, suggestion, concern, or anything like that, you should uh, drop us a line. We have a couple different ways for you to get a hold of us if you'd like to and maybe participate actively in the Creep Geeks podcast. And the easiest thing to do is to just like go to Facebook. We share memes and funny stuff like that. And you can sit there and laugh and just scroll away. Or you can send us an email. Contact at creepgeeks.com. Or you can go to our website. Creepgeeks.com. Click on the contact form. Or you can go to our Instagram where we have a pretty in, uh, active uh, Instagram page there and comment. Yeah. Maybe do a little direct message. Uh, the fact is, is that you have a couple different ways, if you'd like, to share with us. Now let's share with you. Okay, so before we get into the podcast, let's talk about a couple different things. Right, main podcast uh, podcast subject is going to be Shadow People One Hundred and One, but let's do some real quick news because some of this news is pretty interesting, and these are things that we've touched about and talked upon, or whenever, a little while ago, right? Yeah, we talked about Finn's treasure, this crazy guy from New Mexico, with his treasure, and it was found. Guess where it was found? I thought it would be found in Colorado or Me New too. Mexico. Yeah. Nope, Wyoming. How? That's what he said. I still think it's a little fishy. The guy who found it allegedly still doesn't want to uh, share who he is or any of that stuff. But told Finn he could tell people where it was. It was in Wyoming. And when I found it out, I stopped caring. Yeah, because I'm sorry, that doesn't seem to match up with what I thought were commonly accepted clues. Yep, but evidently it does because okay. Finn's like, yep, well, you know. So, so I'm like, not whatever. falling for it. Yeah, I'm like, mm, all right, something's a little weird there. Speaking of something weird, there has been uh, instances of mysterious seeds being mailed to people's homes. Yeah, and it was getting shared all over Facebook. A few of us saw some memes. But essentially, unsolicited small packages of seeds were being mailed to various homes across the United States. Where were these seeds from? The Chinas. 
They were from China. Yeah. <clears throat> so these mysterious seeds, you know, hey, they can cause a You don't know what's being mailed. Yeah. Right? So you don't really know what these seeds are. If this is a highly invasive species that could take over our uh, American heartland. Ecosystem. Yeah. It, you know, it's an invasive species, right? It could be a problem. Don't know really what they were. So the word went out, hey, if you receive mysterious seeds from China, do not plant them. Yeah. Well, evidently, a bunch of people have planted them. <laughs> so, I don't know. So, pretty much what it boils down to is that, you know, the they worry that the, since the packages of seeds were unknown as to their type, they could have been an invasive, uh, invasive plant species. And, you know, that's a real concern with our agricultural and things like that because they wreak havoc on the environment and they can displace or destroy native plants and insects and severely damage c- crops. Yeah. Crops are what we eat. It's just a general <laughs> term, right? I mean, I guess if it's grown in the ground, it can be grown in mass quantity. Well, it's a crop, right? I mean, you know, not just destroy our crops. It could affect our environment as it stands. I mean, we have invasive species that are still wrecking havoc on the south. Things like kudzu, which was planted back in, like, colonial times. Yes, yeah, the grows like crazy. And it eats... It eats buildings, you yeah. know. There's certain types of ivy that were planted all over uh, colonial Virginia. That stuff kind of destroyed a lot of brick buildings and stuff like that. So you have to be careful with what you plant. Or what you plant could take out a species that is doing well in your area. Kill some bugs. These yeah. bugs kill other bugs. It just becomes a, a sort of chain of life thing. Yeah. So weeks ago, if you had gotten a mysterious packet of um seeds it was recommended you contact your state's uh agricultural services you just go on to google and find it some states like virginia had a special office you could call but yeah it's a top secret organization called office of plant industry services or yeah. opus <laughs> yeah it's like where do you work i work at opus i know what do you do i can't tell you yeah lots of plants it's like the plant secret service man how plant spies we do have a little bit of an update and that's the fact that um the mystery the mystery seeds in china they've been identified so far as vegetables herbs and flowers and um researchers have put a name to at least 14 of the plant species as of the end of july which included mustard cabbage and morning glory as well as things like mint sage rosemary and lavender hibiscus and rose were also found yeah now what the usda is saying is that this might be part of a larger scam called a brushing scam yeah which is where you are sent a product for free in order to boost uh fake sales and fake reviews yes like almost all the reviews on amazon but it doesn't make sense because you'd have to be aware that you'd need to go onto a website and show that you made a purchase or that you left a review. So I'm not really, I'm not really getting that. Yeah. So this is either a case of invasive species, these, these devil seeds, or it's a new type of spam now an art from China, it. right? Yeah. Seed spam. <laughs> they could be spy seeds. Well, an Arkansas man who planted them on his property before the warnings were issued said the plant is now producing large white fruit from orange flowers that resemble those of squash. And when those squash grow, eyes and lips <laughs> and teeth. So, all right. So, if you get any uh, Chinese spam seeds, don't plant. They could be spy seeds. Yeah. Call the, uh, what was the name of that top secret? Spy seed. Well, for Virginia, Office of Plant Industry Services in Virginia, you can call them. I'm sure they can. I'm sure they'll be able to answer. Yeah, but you know, you'd be like, "Hey, I'm from Wyoming." They'd probably redirect you to whatever service. And I got these seeds, and they're probably like, "You know what? Here's what you got to do with those things: throw them in the fire." You can alternately call USDA Agricultural Division for your particular state. Yeah, don't plant them. And if you do, and you don't know what it is, I probably wouldn't eat it. Oh gosh, no. Spy seeds. All right, so moving back into the podcast, this is something else we need to touch upon. So we talked about Finn earlier when the treasure, and we've been talking about that off and on for like two years. Yeah. The spy seeds I thought were pretty interesting to talk about. We also talk about this, because we have talked about spy stuff in the past, and we talked about Russians, and when the Russians got mad that we created a space force, and they were saying things like, you shouldn't militarize space, and they were all indignant about the whole thing. Well, guess what they just did? 
What? Well, according to U.S. Space Command, Russia just tested an anti-satellite weapon in orbit. Hmm. Which means that, you know, they're saying, hey, guys, you shouldn't be doing that. But what are they doing? They're doing exactly the same thing. So according to this, on July 15, 2020, a Russian satellite, which the the United States has been keeping a close tabs on, right? And this is actually from Mysterious Universe. They're keeping a tab on this satellite because it was it basically showing sinister behavior. Okay. Like, you know, pulling right up to a satellite, right? Yeah. Shadowing it, making fun of it, knocking its books out of its hand, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so, it basically, it's acting erratically, man. It's coming up on satellites like, you know, what are you doing? Why, why is it getting so close? But anyway, what the deal is, is that, you know, there was a phone call that was made between our president, President Donald Trump, and Russian President Vladimir Putin, where they talk about some stuff about arms control and they congratulated each other on the 45th anniversary of the Joint Soyuz Apollo program. You know, just kind of dancing around the issue. Hey. But evidently one of their satellites took out a satellite. One of their own satellites. Oh, okay. So it was a test. So, if you have a satellite up in space that could take out another satellite, that's pretty bad, right? Because, I mean, satellites are our communications, power, you know, internet, television, banking systems, all that sort of thing. So, it's a thing that it's been a fear for ever since the space race was created. Wait, so it's a satellite that took out another satellite? It's a satellite killing satellite. Yep. Okay. Hmm. So, this is like, you know, in-orbit anti-satellite weaponry. Okay. Which makes the Russians pretty hypocritical, right? Yeah. They talk about outer space arms control, and what do they do? They turn around and do exactly what they were saying that we were going to do. Yeah. Which just means that we've already done it. Really? Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm sure. I, I would have, I mean, that would be the first thing you'd want to do, right? Is have a way to take out other spy satellites that may be up there, and also maybe a way to you know defend yourself. Okay. So, I think if anything, the president just said, we're going to have a space program and we're going to continue to do what we do. And so the Russians said, ah, we're angry. You shouldn't do that. And then they said, ah, look what we could do. We could do it too. You're not a big tough guy. You know, because they were embarrassed back in the olden days of Ronald Reagan. We talked about Star Wars and stuff like that. He can just blast you from anywhere on the planet from atmosphere and rods of God and all that sort of thing. So, I just thought it was kind of funny because we... We talked about it in our podcast. Yeah. We're like, look, they're just saying this because they've already done it or they're going to do it. And they did. It's like, okay, there we go. (laughs) So do we need to worry? Eh, I don't know. Probably not so much. But this is something we also talked about. We're going to kind of touch on this because we've been talking a little bit about UFOs and a recent disclosure quotes in the air, if you want to call it that, about you know, the government and UFOs and, oh, they're telling us that there's actually UFOs. But if you actually read the articles and then you turn around and read the new articles, they haven't disclosed anything at all. As a matter of fact, they've even reached out to pretty much say that some of the evidence that was out there with these slides that happened in the Pentagon press. Uh, uh, I don't think it was Pentagon, but anyway, during a press briefing is, oh, look, a classified brief, briefing. There you go. That you know, these were like these top secret government slides that were put out there yeah. and they weren't. It was a slideshow presentation. It wasn't marked with any classification and things like that. If you're in the government and you have a clearance or have had a clearance and you've gone to any classified secret or top secret briefing, they, everything is annotated with the basically the classification of the material that you have. None of those were the, just none of those were marked appropriately. It was obvious to people in the government that these aren't necessarily legit slides and even came out and said something now what they could have done the government and disclosure with ufos and all sort of thing is not said anything at all right in other words if it was real they probably wouldn't have said anything but they actively stepped out and said no we've never that's not ours that wasn't a, a briefing that we put on none of that stuff was legit and around the same time maybe slightly before you know when the washington post posted all the stuff that it had you know for disclosure from the government they had to come back out uh, later on and say, no, there was no UFO crashed off-world vehicle, you know, recovered crafts or anything like that. So anyway, moving back into it again, we've talked that the possibility that a large, large percentage of what people are seeing to be UFOs are really just government craft, right? Yeah. 
Because, I mean, you, you, we talked about drones. We've talked about 3D hologram technology that's been out there. We talked about all that stuff. And if it's available now, it's probably been available or, or maybe even being perfect, perfected by our government a long time ago. I I believe that the government is at least 30 to 50 years ahead of us as a standard consumer in technology. Okay. So we talk about, okay, well, maybe some of the things that people are actually seeing are drones. I'm not, I'm not talking about quadcopter drones, but, you know, unmanned, you know, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, drones, whether it's like in a propeller driven drone or maybe a helicopter, copter blade, you know, drone, just an, an unmanned aerial vehicle. Okay. So if that be the case and they're actually out there and they've been out there for a really long time, it would make sense that with the advanced progression of technology that it'd be more advanced now than what people can currently buy. I have a drone on my shelf on my shelf over here that'll fly by itself. That you can buy for like six hundred bucks and it'll just fly around. You can program the waypoints. It'll go on this little mission, do its job, and come back. I and know. we talked about Taiwan with all those drones. Remember all those little light shows they put on with like 500 drones flying around? T-Mobile just did that for a commercial. Yeah, and, and that's all like recent stuff. And, and yes, technology just in the consumer drone world has jumped by leaps and bounds over the past couple of years. But it, it's just really hard for me to accept drone technology way back when, you know, during the height of the UFO phenomena, you know? Well, I mean, if you count the height of the UFO phenomenon really being from, let's just say, 1947 to 1970. Yeah. I mean, we have rocket drones that we fly, like in the military, that are there to act like missiles so that our inbound missile systems can track them and destroy them. Hmm. Those things are very old. They've had radio-controlled craft ever since Marconi and the Telegraph. So it's entirely possible that our government has been basically building and controlling and working this radio control technology and turned it into something. Okay. Like, you know, Al Gore didn't invent the Internet. The inter- Internet was basically Berners-Lee and was made for DARPA, right? Yeah. So our first networks and Internet and connectivity and things like that, that was all done through DARPA, and that's government. You know, like military style government so and i came across this article it says nuclear powered drones the cia may have had them in the 1970s hmm. <laughs> it's- so that kind of makes sense to me if you have a drone that's powered within one of these nuclear batteries because these are some of the batteries they use in space for our craft to go out there satellites if you will long-range missions to be powered for decades yeah and that's something that's a true thing what would happen if the CIA decided to use that to power a flying machine and it would just fly around and do its thing? It could fly almost indefinitely. I mean, the Predator drone now flies for like 24 hours straight before it has to land. Oh, yeah. So what if the CIA or somebody like that, you know, decided, you know, we don't care about a nuclear battery and if it crashes somewhere, we we don't care. I mean, if you didn't care about that kind of thing and you could use nuclear power to power a vessel, a flying machine, a drone, that's something, right? Because one of the things you always worry about is fuel. Fuel is always a limiting factor but then, of all of this kind of thing and flying around and all that stuff. So, In that same argument, though, I mean, if we had the ability to make a such a compact nuclear device, wouldn't we be concerned about where it landed or where it crashed and make sure it gets taken care of immediately should it crash? Not if you're the CIA in the 70s. Hmm. Because that would lead it to getting into the wrong hands should it crash. Well, maybe if it crashed, and maybe if it's just a small amount of radioactive material and it destroys itself, you wouldn't care because then you wouldn't have to prove where it came from. Got to prove it. You'd be like, hey, CIA, you have a nuclear uh, powered drone. And you'd be like, no, I don't. Prove it. (laughs) If you don't care because you're using national security as the, you know, underlying principle for the mission, you don't care. Okay. So if you look at an article that came out from uh, one of our, our favorite people that uh, I like the way, I like the stories he tells and the stuff that he finds. That's always interesting. Paul Seaburn, he wrote an article that says nuclear powered drones, the CIA may have had them in the 1970s. And it's a memorandum that pertains to the operation known as Aqualine, right? 
Aqualine was, a, was or is a restrictive access involving small powered, uh, well, a small powered glider capable of flying thousands of miles, right? Mm-hmm. And in placing devices, interrogating previously in place devices, and performing special reconnaissance or collected or collection mission, missions. In other words, you know, going out and finding, you know, information, spying. Yeah. And it says, you know, and the cool thing about this is that on radar, it presents like a bird. <laughs> so it looks like a bird on radar, and it has the same acoustic and visual signatures designed to blend in. But birds aren't Within the signal man. environment. <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at this thing, and there's supposed to be an alleged picture of it, it doesn't look like a bird per se, but it looks like some kind of futuristic craft. Man, it's got a little propeller in the back. Maybe from the it's sky. It's a glider. It looks like a bad seagull or yeah. something. I don't know. And, you know, <clears throat> and that would make it more futuristic than the drones that we currently have. You know, so if you look at this, this was a, a CIA document that allegedly got declassified that came out from the 1960s, which des- describes a propeller-driven drone disguised as a bird, and it would fly spying missions over the Soviet Union in retaliation for shooting down the U-2 spy plane. And if you think 120, di- 120 days sounds like a long time for a drone to stay aloft, Right. Yeah. And today's Predator drones need to land after about 24 hours. You're forgetting what the main focus of the Cold War was, nuclear power. Okay. And if you're wondering what these uh, may have been mistaken for in the 1960s UFO report, you may be right. They were birds, man. They look like little birds. So you got the mission flight planning, the controlling charts, the routes, mount, or the, the route photos and computer program tapes. All of that stuff would be prepared at Area 51 and ferried to the forward base. What did we say a while ago? You probably don't remember, but I remember because I said it. It's like, okay, Area 51 doesn't hold UFOs and stuff like that. Yeah. It was primarily a, an air base, and there's probably no spy craft there anymore because they're probably building drones and drone technology. That's a perfect place to test all that stuff. And you said the drone thing a long time ago. Yeah. But now, like, I mean... Way past 2019. And now that, you know, Storm Area 51 and all that has come and gone, even before that, I, you were saying that you think everything had already been moved. Yeah. So I think once it came out in Congress or Senate or whatever it was, where that sen- senator or congressman, honestly, I can't remember because it's kind of late, you know, sort of spilled the beans about it. It was long gone. I think that mission had shifted from aircraft into smaller UAVs. Yeah. And if they're using a nuclear-powered battery to make this little bird thing from the 60s fly around for 120 days, imagine what they could do 40 years later. Hmm. Maybe have some kind of alternative-style propulsion that maybe the U.S. military has already, like the Navy, has already filed patents for? Yeah, but this, this would suggest leaps and bounds made from just the 60s to the 70s alone. Uh. And yeah, there has been. If you think about the leaps and bounds that was made from the late 40s into the 60s, where we went from propeller-driven craft to dropping the atomic bomb and having rockets going into space, that is an astronomical leap. Oh. And what's to say that leap would stop? Why Why would the progression slow? Money. <laughs> and they're writing their own checks for this kind of thing. That's a thing. It's Money black and a lack of... I mean, or, uh, black box technology, right? Or uh, black projects, I should say. I mean, yeah, but even with the black projects, we only can reverse <clears throat> engineer technology from other sources, or our own level of innovation ends up plateauing at some point. Well, let me give you an example, the example of a level of innovation that basically changed society. Okay. And it was the miniaturization of electronics. Sure. So, like, Big radios went to these little handheld transistor radios in the 60s into the 70s, became really popular, and later on became the Walkman and things like that. And what they did was took these resistors and transistors and things like that that were printed out and, you know, installed on the board, soldered in place, and all that sort of thing. And the big innovation was, and the Japanese get credit for being these technology innovators, and they're really not. Okay, so the U.S. put out this technology, this, these electronics. Everything was getting smaller. And, and what gave us a huge leap as society as a whole was the Japanese flipped that board over. 
the circuit board and put circuits on the other side. Okay. So thereby reducing, for the most part, if you want to look at it in a really sort of generic sort of way, taking the technology and by putting additional circuits on the back of it, reduce or miniaturize electronics by like between 30 and 60%. I know, but that's kind of a like a conceptual train of thought. Let's make these things smaller. Right. Let's make everything more portable. Uh, with with this drone and flight in general, it would suggest then why didn't we all just start flying via nuclear vehicles all the time? Who's to say we haven't been? You're just making my point. No. Who's to say that the government hasn't been doing that <laughs> with like, you know, the SR-71, 72 Blackbird and all that sort of thing? Okay, so and then the other projects like Aurora and everything else has happened like that. Who's to say that hasn't stopped? But the miniaturization of spy technology through the CIA, you know, like small recording devices and things that couldn't be seen, eventually that leaked into the general consciousness of the consumer. Well, it's not even consciousness. It just leaked as for consumption. So then that idea or that concept probably transformed into let's make everything smaller and portable. Because it was already smaller and portable, and the companies that were doing that sort of thing said, and "Oh, we need to capitalize on the patent so useful, we can make money." Useful option as you know, nuclear powered aerial vehicles that that would definitely have to get brought into the consumer mainstream world. No, because if it's nuclear powered, and the big fear happens that you're going to basically drop an atomic bomb, right? which is effectively what everybody would think. You know, you have an, a, an atomic-powered plane, and it falls out of the sky. You're dropping, effectively, a nuclear bomb out of the sky. People aren't going to like that. But that consequence would also be realized at the top-secret level as well. Well, of course. Like, to my earlier so then, point, what would happen if one of these just crashed? Would the CIA have to go retrieve it under, like, covert ops or what? What it would, would probably depend where it is, but since the, if the CIA is smart enough to make a bird be able to fly for 120 days, I'm pretty sure they're smart enough to make it where the thing will blow up. I mean, even in the TV shows from the 60s, right? Mission Impossible, this tape will self-destruct. I'm not this, buying it. <laughs> how can you, I don't understand how you can't buy it. Because if you're thinking that the advances in technology stopped and innovation stopped, once it became public consumption, that's just where that technology may have ended for them, where it was no longer viable to keep using that technology as a means to continue the Cold War. Everybody thinks that World War II was the end, everything stopped. No. It has never stopped. It just turned into a Cold War. And the only difference between between a real world and a cold a real war and a cold war is the amount of bombs don't match up. You don't drop as many. All became the spy thing. <clears throat> and if you have technology that's been miniaturized, right, what's the biggest advantage of miniaturized technology? Smartphone? No, it's smaller. Smaller. So you could take a room full of computer, right? Yeah. Like Interac or Generac or whatever it was, and turn it and make it, instead of being an entire floor, into one room, into a suitcase, Right, and, and pretty soon you're dealing with like laptops and desktop computers, and now we have our phones are the computing power you have in your phone right now. Even if it's a dirt cheap, stupid phone that you'd buy, that's not really you know as like quad processing and all this other crazy stuff. Like a regular old smartphone has more computing power than the entire space program. Yeah, until like the eighties. Yeah. Because once you make it smaller, and you can keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller, and that innovation is still there, but now the public sector is involved with all these companies and stuff, you, you, the innovation doesn't actually stop. So, I, like I said, I think that most of what we see in the sky that we think are UFOs are not. They're just government technology. I mean, and and I can kind of see that. I, I can see that possibility. It's just to say some of it or, you know, a majority of it or even a significant portion of it is is nuclear or was nuclear in the 60s and 70s. That's just really hard for me to fathom because the consequences, and while, you know, Paul Seaburn says in this article, it doesn't seem to have been a concern during the Cold War. Why would it be? We built nuclear um, bombs. But I'm also thinking of, like, you know, when you watch that B-roll testing, like when you watch 
certain government history programs where people are just doing all this crazy government top secret testing and it's a catastrophic failure. I'm like, I, the same had to have happened with these nuclear devices as well. Yeah, but if you had one that was like the size of a transistor battery or let's just say a 9-volt battery, and if that thing blew up, it's not going to be like, you know, Hiroshima or Nagasaki. You, it probably wouldn't create such a devastating thing. I mean, come on. Allegedly, you have like the Soviets that were basically dumping spent nuclear reactor rods into the deepest part of the sea up around where they hang out to get rid of them. I mean, look at Chernobyl. We had Three Mile Island. We had these incidents where nuclear, modern, current nuclear technology didn't go so well. But if you look at Three Mile Island, and when they were afraid that Three Mile Island was going to melt down, and this was a big crisis because I was in elementary school when this was going down, they called in the U.S. Navy to yeah. fix that because we have vessels already that are powered by nuclear reactors. We have submarines and aircraft carriers. You know, we have atomic weapons and nuclear-powered weapons, so the government, the military, has been on top of this nuclear stuff for a while. If you're the expert in that field and you're advancing, you know, the product that you're working on, let's just say it's nuclear power technology, plus we remember we had these nuclear batteries that went off into space. If they're not for general public consumption or for a general public consumer and it's military based, you're going to continue the innovation. Okay. And if you're not worried about this atomic bomb going off anywhere because it's not really a big deal in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to blow the planet up and you don't care because you want to know how many nuclear missiles that Soviets have and all this other crazy stuff. The mission is going to be the most important thing. So they don't think they cared. Why would they? But if they're using drone technology and it's been a thing that was basically the base of operations would be like at Area 51 and where they're building, able to build prototypes and test them and get them working and all that stuff. You know, if they had like five different prototypes, of these things like this article is saying it was made by McDonnell Douglas and they had a capability to drop payloads, take regular and infrared photographs and basically air defense radar snoop on Russian radio traffic and stuff like that. They would relay the data via some sort of some, some kind of data uplink like a C-47, and they could retrieve it midair by helicopter or something crazy like that, it wouldn't be a big deal. And if one of those things crashed and could effectively destroy itself or just the crash itself would destroy it to the point where they didn't care, you know? I don't know. It totally makes sense to me. 100%. (laughs) It does. I mean, I'm not saying that all UFO sightings and things like that that we see these days are 100% government, but I know an 80% of it's straight up military. And I'm actually okay with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, as far as the nuclear drone theory, I just, especially back then, it's too much. It's too far reaching for me. I mean, I just cannot picture any amount of nuclear technology or, you know, nuclear components being on the loose. So happens all the time. I mean, we have cities that are powered by nuclear technology. I know, but you we've know. had bombers flying across the U S actually lose atomic bombs. One of them landed on a swamp I know, close it, to where we lived in, in North Carolina, right? At least that's in the United States. If one of these drones is doing covert operations over Siberia or Russia or any country around them and even 6.4 kilograms of uranium gets loose that's still 6.4 kilograms of uranium somebody's going to yeah but they've dug thousands of pounds of uranium out of the ground in new mexico yeah i don't think they were worried about this at all i think that they the the yield that would come off of something like this if it crashed or whatever was not a concern to them okay you know, and they were saying the engine in this thing would probably be about the size of a chainsaw when it first started. But if you look at thermoelectrics and the bat- basically using a battery that doesn't stop, you know, for 120 days at least to be able to make a propeller and a really lightweight craft with a little payload and things that it could do, they're not worried about this battery because it would not be a big battery. They don't care. All right. 
So, you know, and they, and they say, oh, well, the, you know, the program was cut before it was operational. Whenever I see that, after they've already spent $100 million in 1970s money, <laughs> sure, just like, oh, yeah, that space program, uh, I'm sorry, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon program was cut. Right? Yeah. Oh, but wait, we didn't really cut it. <laughs> we just renamed it something. Yeah, well, and made it smaller we're going to continue to rename it, and now we want government funding for it. I don't think it ever went away. I don't think this drone thing went away. I think that there's even smaller drones now. Hmm. I mean, imagine if you could make a drone the size of a dragonfly and use solar power, like photo cells, on its wings to create lift and everything like that. It could fly around and do its job. I mean, come on, man. Well, we already have friends that do like the little competitive drone racing. Then those things yeah, are Yeah, and those things small. are, yeah, they're not much bigger than like a VHS tape. Yeah. Well, not that big. Well, it depends on which ones you've yeah. got. I mean, but they come in different sizes, of course. So uh, I don't think this was an issue. I think this program kept going. I think that, like I said, most of the stuff that we've seen is government technology. We alluded to the fact a while ago that Area 51 is probably for basically experimental craft and like primarily drones. And I can tell you this we went and did. One of our Navy jobs, you know, we were out there and there was a ship qualifying to shoot missiles and stuff like that because it was going to be commissioned. They loaded up all these rocket powered drones on our ship so we could launch them so that they could shoot them down with the missile systems. Okay. And one of the, I remember one of the ones that we recovered, the body of it that we actually recovered because when they flew, they flew until they ran out of fuel and then they crashed in the water and we picked them up. The body on that thing was from 1962. Oh. And this was in the 90s. And it was a drone? Yeah. It was a, basically, it was like a flying missile. Okay. And it would fly as fast as a missile, and you could program the course and speed and all that sort of thing. It was basically radio-controlled, and it had fail-safes built into it so that a ship could detect it as an incoming missile, flying as a missile, and could shoot it down. It's a standard thing. It's getting qualified. You, you have to certify your weapon systems on the ships before they can be commissioned. Just like, you know, you go certify to use a, a, a pistol or, you know, a handgun if you were a cop. Okay. Since the 60s. My dad, who's in his 70s, basically recovered those drones with one of the boats he was on. They were old PT boats that were repurposed to be basically rocket drone recovery vehicles. Yeah. And this is not like some sort of secret thing. This is every every government does this. British did it. I mean, everybody does it. It's just standard thing. You launch one of these things like a flying rocket, and it's effectively what it is, and fly it around for a while. The ship is supposed to shoot it down, or whatever is supposed to be shooting it shoots it down, and you go recover what's left. So, you know. Okay. So there you go. It looks like a lot of what we see in the sky is not UFOs. It's basically government. And I think it's great the government's getting involved and saying, hey, we'd like to keep researching these unidentified aerial phenomenons and stuff. We need some money. Kind of like Project Blue Book all over again. Hmm. And I think it's great that some of the disclosure articles and stuff that we read in the newspaper and seen on TV eh, didn't really disclose a whole lot. Because it's as much the same. And, you know, some people just hated what we said when we said that. They're like, oh, I totally 1,000% completely disagree. <laughs> and I'm like, the simple answer is usually the most obvious and correct answer, right? It's like yeah. Occam's razor. Oh, which I, makes more sense. Of course, the very end of this article, it's almost like this was written for you. Food for thought, especially if you think most UFOs are actually secret military aircraft. I was in the military. I had a top secret clearance and a secret clearance. We did stuff that was commonplace in the military that would, you know, oh, my God, I can't believe you guys did that. And it wasn't a big deal. You know what I mean? So what's normal for you is extraordinary from so, for somewhere else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So to me, it makes sense. Like, can I see the government creating a bird? Right? With quotes, powered by a nuclear battery to go spy on Russia. Yes, I could totally see that. Just think about it. Like, remember the James Bond movies? Mm -hmm. Don't roll your eyes when I say James Bond. 
I will turn your microphone off right okay. now. Okay. <laughs> you know, with a cane that shoots guns and all stuff, a lot of that stuff came from the spy and the OSS and everything else from World War II. So the fact that you're, the fact for me that you would make the leap to aliens from outer space versus our own government technology, that's even more scary. No, I'm not saying that. I mean, I do think that. Turn your mic off. <laughs> yeah. If you talk, you. I didn't turn it off. Okay. I am saying <coughs> that I think there's a lot of credibility to the concept that, yes, a lot of what we're seeing is military, but I do think there's still a possibility a lot of what was reported in the past, <coughs> especially in the past, was not of terrestrial origin. So. Well. I would say, since the entire world was scared to death and fighting a war, that you'd be surprised what you could do. Okay. Especially if you don't care. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in war and during World War II, World War II, they had no conscience, man. Millions of people were executed. We wouldn't even think about doing that today. Yeah. Different time. I mean, think about it. The atomic bomb got dropped, stuff like that. So I don't think that was really you know too worried. Yep. I don't know. No, I'm not. Like I said, I'm not saying that all alien sightings and and UFO or unexplained phenomena sightings that you see in the sky are government, but I'm pretty sure a lot of them are. Yeah, I mean the so. concept is there, and I do think it more and more that's getting disclosed or the more and more we investigate and research that evidence is certainly there, but there's, there's a handful of things that I cannot let go of as being government. So I I don't know. Well, I know it causes you some pain, but speaking of pain. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So basically there's an article saying that Neanderthals were not so uh, or Neanderthals, depending on how you want to pronounce it, I don't care. I can't even pronounce it, but they just couldn't handle pain. That's like what they're us, saying. Us more evolved humans. And we're not talking like ginger people oh, who yeah. allegedly need 19% more anesthesia and medicine because of their genetic makeup. That's a real thing. I'm not just making it up for these people that say they don't have any souls. Yeah, but according to this new study, ne- ne- tander, ne- it's Neanderthal. Neanderthals. Um, had a much lower pain threshold than most modern-day humans. Yep. The genetic analysis of Neanderthals has indicated that they had a type of gene that made them very sensitive to any type of pain, which is funny because, you know, if you grew up in the 80s like me and watched certain cartoons of, like, cavemen and stuff like that, they were always getting into very uh, gregarious accents, very, you know, just run over by a woolly mammoth and stuff like that you know or hitting each other with clubs so very brutish people but apparently they were big wimps so the gene that they had uh the gene affected was a gatekeeper protein that amplified their pain as much as seven percent and what's even more incredible is that the gene passed down through generations and as many as one in 250 people today carry that more sensitive pain threshold and those people are wusses hey <laughs> um now according to a researcher um at the max Planck institute for evolutionary anthropology and karolinska institute uh explains this as the biggest factor for how much pain people report is their age Carrying the Neanderthal variant of the ion channel makes you experience more pain, similar to if you were eight years older. Ooh, that's awful. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> yeah. So there you go. Neanderthals were wimps, according to a genetic study. Yeah. Uh, I think if you ever met a Neanderthal in person, you probably wouldn't say that to their face. Oh, well. This article goes on to say that Neanderthals took aspirin with quotes for their toothaches and back in 2017 it was reported when researchers studied a jawbone belonging to a neanderthal they found an antibiotic fungus called penicillium and bits of a poplar tree that carried salicylic acid which is an active ingredient in aspirin 
He apparently took the medicine to help relieve the discomfort he would have felt from the plaque and tooth abscesses that the experts found when analyzing his jaw. Huh. So maybe that was their role. Maybe because it hurt more, they had to find a cure for it, and it just basically helped everybody. Yeah. See, I think a lot of people think that when we look back at our prehistoric ancestors and dinosaurs and things like that, and then even back to people that were maybe 10,000 years in the past, it's primitive, like we... Primitive yeah, people. Well, let's just say, yeah, primitive people, whatever. They, we, we had the idea that they were stupid. And then we're, we're continually blown away, we're like during the Bronze Age, and we're like, oh... Yeah, they made crude weapons, you know, out of bronze, and they didn't really know what they were doing. But then, then they they try to recreate some of that today, and they can't. And they find out these crude weapons really weren't crude. They were pretty innovative. They're, yeah, they're shocked the at how much they had. They're, they're they're always shocked at how much thought goes into making this because I think what scientists and people like that and the regular person, including myself, fail to realize is how much effort it actually takes to do anything back in those times. Yeah. So considering the resources and the limited frame of reference, that's a big thing. Cause you know, like today I have a frame of reference of smartphones and automobiles and stuff like that. These people didn't have that um, just for basic tools even. And just to accomplish what they did and to make it last through, you know, the violent environment that they, they lived in. It's incredible. What? That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. What? <laughs> Use a more basic example. You can walk into a room and flick a switch and have light. Yeah. A caveman has to build a fire. Mm-hmm. Which one takes longer? The fire. Of course. Yeah. So all the effort they had to put into doing the most rudimentary basic things. Mm-hmm. Everything takes longer. Can you imagine how long it would take to make a pizza? <laughs> First off. <laughs> they made bread. Bread. We've talked about that in the podcast where when they basically started you know, taking grains with them. and they, So they had the crust all ready to roll. Bread was basically a few thousand years later. but um, we, few, It was not. We don't really know. But going back to like what you were saying, like, you know, we always considered them dumb. A lot of that goes to like the conditioning that we had. Like I mentioned, I was an 80s baby. So all the TV and all the cartoons and stuff like that always depicted them as like brutish, dumb people. And that's just not the case. Nope. So, I mean, can you imagine how shocked these scientists were when they found out this guy's taking an aspirin for a bum tooth? I know. And he's a freaking caveman. I mean, penicillium, (coughs) which. <coughs> Excuse me. Which wasn't even me an aspirin. You know, used till way later. So Yep. And then we act shocked when we were like, look what we have done. We have created penicillin. The caveman <laughs> is back there eating penicillin moss or whatever fungus fungus it was. <laughs> and sucking on an aspirin made from a basically a bark root. It's like, ooh, look what the hairless people did. Ooh, you created something that we've been doing for thousands of years. Like, ooh, so you get a tattoo, whoop de doo We've been doing that ever since somebody got stabbed with a pointy rock, right? And a little dirt on it. You're like, huh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, and you know, the scary thing is, if you want to make the leap to it, we do this with animals. We think that animals aren't as smart as we are, and they don't understand. When they probably are just as intelligent as we are, yeah. in their own way. Yeah. You should feel really bad now. When no. you treat your animal like an animal, when you're really, like, heartbroken. Because they get treated that way. It's not my fault Pepper's not interested in the podcast topics tonight. <laughs> no, she's not. She's like, I'm taking a nap. It's hot and stormy. Yeah. Speaking of hot and stormy, we're going to talk about shadow people. Okay. Okay, so this is Shadow People 101. All right. Now, this is basically nuts and bolts. Just a general overview of shadow people. Should I use the uh, definition on the internet? I mean, it depends how long you want to make the podcast, but yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, taken from Wikipedia, a shadow person, also known as a shadow figure, shadow being, or black mass, is the perception of a patch of shadow as a living humanoid figure and interpreted as the presence of a spirit or other entity by believers in the paranormal or supernatural. So what does all that mean? It's a shadowy figure that yeah. you may see. <clears throat> so here's the problem that we have with shadow people. If you look at what is a shadow person or what are shadow people, 
and you hear people describe them, it, it, one description does not fit for the instances which people see shadow people. No, they don't. So, no, because they're all different. So what I figured we would do is just kind of do some sort of a break it, basic break it, a, a basic breakdown. So when you look at like what is or what are shadow people, there's a couple different schools of thought. First thought is it's the true form of a ghost or a spirit. That's one way of looking at it. Okay. Another way is that some people say these are like time travelers, people looking in from the future to the past and observing. Yeah. And other people say, well, they're not really time travelers. These are more interdimensional beings that can exist in their dimension and our dimension at the same time. And whatever reasons are there depends on whatever reason why they're there. It could be a multitude of different reasons. Now, does that last definition, interdimensional beings, does that also cover like evil entities and good Not necessarily. Entities? Okay. Because, see, the purpose of the shadow being kind of depends on a couple of different factors. Okay. So one question that was raised a while ago by Rosemary Ellen Guiley, she says these shadow people are basically the jinn. And, you know, she was one of the leading experts in the field of paranormal stuff, and she identified them as a category of creature called the jinn. Okay. The D-J-I-N-N or I-N, sort of like spirits. These are like elemental style spirits that don't necessarily or maybe don't really exist in the way we look at things. These are spirits that weren't human, not necessarily demonic per se, but these are the, the, the beings that sort of exist in between. Okay. Look, when you talk about like forest spirits and just spirits in general that were like lower class demons or just basically these things that live in between the veil and, and us and them and that kind of thing. Like spirits that weren't human. Okay. But aren't necessarily your full on demons either. All right. So tricksters, shadow things and stuff like that, you know, they're all part of the gym. So, if you look at the the term shadow people, according to the internet, it says that Heidi Hollis coined the term shadow people from some books that she's written, like What Are Shadow People? The the Supernatural Entities Are Scarier Than Any Horror Movie. And there's some articles on that, and she also wrote one about the hat man, which is different. But the two classes of shadow people that we're going to concentrate on or break them down into are this. Two classes. Spiritual, Mm -hmm. which we're going to say like ghosts. Okay. Right, And then everything else, which would be the jinn, maybe possibly demon, interdimensional, time traveler, that kind of thing. Yeah. So those are the two classes. And it seems to be there's two very definitive camps. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also about four primary groups or types of shadow people. Oh. So you've got two primary classes and let's just say four primary types. Okay. The first type is residual, like residual haunting These things are are primarily or normally non-interactive. They're not really aware of your presence. They're more like the ghosts. So the shadow that walks past the window every night at 9 p.m. or something. Yeah, or shows up in your doorway at 2 a.m., you know, and scares the crap out of you. And you're scared. It doesn't care because it's just doing its whatever. All right. Ties in the stone tape theory and all that sort of thing. Now, the second group would be, these are what we're calling intelligent interactive or the active haunt, or the aware shadow person. Okay, so the shadow person that chases after you when you're going on an evening run and keeps chasing you. Yeah, or is actively haunting, as in you see it and you throw a pillow at it, it moves itself out of the way and comes back to keep eyeballing you. You know, it's it's active, it's aware. Okay. <clears throat> and it's maybe actively haunting the place you're in. Like you might see it on the stairs, or you might see it out of the corner of your eye in your bedroom, and then it moves, it does its own thing. It's aware. And it's actively in the haunt. Okay. Which is kind of scary. Yeah. The third, and these are intentional. These are, they're aware, <clears throat> right? This fourth, or this third primary type. They're intentional in their actions. They're aware of what's going on. They're there primarily to feed off energy, so it, they're like a fear energy feeder. And they're intelligently active, and they have purpose, and that's the thing. These could be like the jinns. Uh, they're malevolent. They can be considered evil. Okay. They have a purpose. That purpose may be to scare you. That you know whatever they can do to be able to feed. Is that the trickster ones? Or? Could be. Okay. Now the fourth ones. These are the ones that I call the observers. <clears throat> they they're there. They seem to observe. 
right? What's going on? They're, they're there to sort of document or whatever. They're semi-interactive, and they usually have a purpose. And then their purpose is a lot of times just to basically observe, observe what's going on. These would be the, your inter, interdimensional sort of time traveling to sort of set up there. Where they're sort of documenting things. They're watchers. Hmm. Okay. So two classes so far. Spiritual, which is going to be like your ghost, and then everything else. <clears throat> and the four primary types... The first type is residual haunting. They're non-interactive. They're normally not aware of you. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the second type is they're intelligent, and they're intelligently interactive. They're actively in the haunt, and they're aware of you. The third type, they're aware. They have intent. So what they do is intentional. They feed off your fear and energy. So we're calling them fear energy feeders, and they're actively intelligent or they're intelligently active. In other words, the stuff that they do is for a purpose. They do things to feed, to get a reaction, whatever it is. And those are what we're calling like the gen, malevolent, evil, right? And then the fourth, they're observing, they're semi-interactive. In other words, these are the ones that if you see them and it knows that you've seen them, and a lot of times they just move on, oh. like step out. Okay, so they're not like the people who take – dmt or have some sort of otherworldly experience well i mean okay. see, that's the hard thing because if they if, if you bring yourself closer to the veil by using sort of an artificial substance or a psychotic uh i shouldn't say psychotic but like a a psychoactive type thing where you have gotten closer to that veil if they're interdimensional they may become aware of you okay you know just like you're aware of them if they're sort of getting closer to us and our veil and the veil is getting thin you may see them in the corner all of a sudden and a lot of times they're like shocked when you notice them because there's a lot of people who are like, oh, if you just see a shadow person, just confront it. It'll go away. And some of them don't. Some of them are like, you, you talking to me? Oh, no. You know, so it kind of depends, right? Yeah. So the next thing we talk about with these guys is the, sh- the shadow people and the, their appearance. And there's a couple different types of appearances that they may have. <clears throat> okay. So I had to cough there. Sorry. So the first one, and this is, they kind of go, it really sort of depends on what scares you, right? Yeah. So the first type of shadow people, that we're going to talk about their appearance, and people see these as, they might be creepers or crawlers. I'm picturing like the horror movie where there's like a creepy black figure in the corner and it's crawling, you know, like up in the ceiling or something. Yeah, or just kind of creeping around. Like you see it creeping from your ottoman in your living room to down the hall. Yeah. You know, or crawling across the ceiling or whatever. Yeah. So the first appearance type, creeper crawlers. The second appearance type is going to be your black mass or your dark mass. These are the ones that are like super dark shadows that you see that are darker than dark in the corner or hiding somewhere or moving across Hmm. like a black mass. Kind of associated with spirits and ghosts and stuff like that. But more solid. Well, you know, no, they're still vaporous and stuff like that, but maybe not as um, misty or whatever. But more like it's it has tangibility to it where it may not necessarily be solid like, you know, a black bowling ball flying across the room, but more like it's got some mass to it. Now, the third appearance type would be your black cloud or your black mist. Mm-hmm. Or it's like really vaporous. Okay. It's kind of floating around doing its thing. And when it comes to the eyes, because some people say these things have eyes, some people don't. That sort of depends. They may have eyes. They may not. And the color of the eyes may be red, yellow, white, or they may not have any eyes at all. Yeah. So that's a possibility, and it doesn't necessarily only adhere to one particular type of appearance in these groups. And the fifth one is sort of universal with most of these things. If they have clothing or garments, they're usually sort of indistinguishable. Yeah. You know it's wearing a coat, but you don't know where the coat comes from. You know, is it a 1600 period coat from like, you know, the waistcoat or is it like a short jacket or is it a shirt? It's literally like a silhouette. Yeah. Yeah. Or like the hat man type thing. No. Oh. Not like the hat man. Okay. The hat man is something different. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But you know that it has some kind of clothing or garments, but it's just not distinct enough to really be able to put a finger on necessarily what time frame. Hmm. So the hat man's different. Yep. So I told you, not like the hat man in the very beginning of all this, because there is a difference between that. And the hat man, I don't necessarily think, we probably might touch on it a little bit later, but I think it's a little bit different than shadow people. Okay. So where do these things come from? That's the question. 
So if you go back to the different types, right? Yeah. The first type being spiritual. You're looking at like haunts, ghosts, like the stone tape theory, or, you know, like memory. Like if it's a ghost and it, it did its thing over and over and over again, it might be tied to the land. If it was a tra- traumatic experience, then this shadow person is basically effectively a spirit in its true form or a ghost in its true form. It may be repeating the same thing out of memory. Okay. Because it's reliving that traumatic event over and over and over again, and it may not necessarily be tied to the land. It may be just tied to an event, right? Or it's doing the haunt. So the first type we talked about which was really sort of the ghost, and then the second type was what? The second type was basically everything else, right? Yeah. Kind of applies with this, too. So when you talk about where they come from, could be haunt, like it's haunting. Could be stone tape tied to the land, repeating a memory, sort of a thing over and over again. Or the memory of a traumatic event is just making it do its thing over and over and over again. Oh, wow. And the second type being everything else, we're talking about it could come from a different time. It could come from, you know, a different space that it occupies. could from a different dimension. Or it could even come from a manifestation of the person that actually sees it, as in stress. Or a traumatic thing, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, typically have a tendency, typically people have a tendency to to notice these things when they're in high levels of stress. Okay. Or have been involved in a situation of, you know, things are just terrible, right? People see it. And, I, you know, I was going to say that, some people can manifest shadow people by the fact that going through puberty or whatever, you know, their their own energies are so high that it's just sort of a splintering off. But that's just sort of a theory. But really what it boils down to is... That same theory is for poltergeist too, though. Exactly. So, yeah. So why do people see shadow people? I mean, it could be a couple different things, right? Why do they see them? Are shadow people dangerous? And how do you get rid of them? And it sort of all sort of falls in the same thing. Some people see them because they actually can just see them, whether they're haunting as in spirit type. They just happen to notice out of the corner of their eye that there's something there. But typically what's involved is, is that either you're in a period of stress in your life, you're in a stressful environment. The house you're living in may be part of a sort of a natural stress. Like maybe that area is just energetically active. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked in the past about going to a place we're downtown we we go to this place and it's haunted but it seems like a lot of stuff that shows up is transitory because of the entire area so you may be getting shadow people or travelers if you will kind of going from one place to the other because of the area that you're in yeah you know your own personal stress in your life the area itself things that are coming in maybe somebody comes into your life that's bringing the stress with you so there's a couple different reasons and why these things may manifest now, on the other side of that, you may see a shadow person for no particular reason at all. It's just there all of a sudden. And then you have to question yourself. Have I noticed it was here? Has it always been here? You know, some people bring these things home with them. They go somewhere and do an investigation or they, you know, get a, an object that belongs to somebody that maybe had some sort of attachment to it. Or they go to someone else's place and has some kind of attachment, and you bring the attachment home, and that attachment sort of manifests as a shadow person. So there's a couple different reasons and, and possibilities of what may cause you to actually be able to see a shadow person, right? Yeah. So are these things dangerous? It kind of depends. I mean, didn't Rosemary <clears throat> and Guiley say that they were very dangerous or had the potential to be? Yeah, she says they're, if they're the jinn, they are very dangerous. You should not mess with them. You should not confront them. You shouldn't challenge them. You shouldn't do anything like that. And what she basically said was, for the most part, don't acknowledge them. Yeah. Go about your business or if you can remove yourself from that situation or whatever it takes, depending on the situation, right? But then to go with that, um, you know, don't acknowledge them. If you're in the camp where you believe they're like a demonic entity and you want to cast them out, just acknowledging that they're there and trying to cast them out is a form of acknowledgement. Yeah. So are you just just making it worse? It depends. It okay. depends on how you acknowledge it. If you give it a name, you're empowering it. If you can you can acknowledge that there's something there. Yeah. Without giving it power. Okay. <clears throat> right? If you acknowledge it's there and it scares you half to death, and it feeds off your fear energy, you are empowering this thing. But if you see it out of the corner of your eye and you just basically ignore it, keep doing your business, if it's something that's maybe not, you know, 
necessarily malevolent or whatever, or maybe if it's the observer type, it's probably just going to move on. All right. When it's done doing what it's got to do, or the environment changes sufficiently where it can't feed if it needs to feed or whatever, if the situation changes, it may just go on. Right? Now, if you run across one of these things that's an observer and you acknowledge it, or like as in you see it, it knows you see it. it in other words, its cover's blown. It might just leave. But you never really know what you got. Right? Yeah. So it kind of makes it sort of hard to figure out, you know, hey, what are you supposed to do here? How do you fix this? So there's supposed to be a couple different ways that you can actually make things better. And, you know, of course, some of this stuff doesn't necessarily feed into the different types and that sort of thing. It's just pretty much like this, seems like, this is what you do. Yeah. And and this is taken. Well, everything we talk about on podcasts you'll find in the show notes, links and everything. But this is like a general guide that we found. Yeah. And and honestly, you could use this list for a lot of for things. For everything. <laughs> yeah. This And this is yeah. the reason why I put this in here is like, these are general things we would do, whether it's a shadow person or you think you brought something home from a thrift store because you bought a haunted mirror or something dumb like that. These are things that you should probably start with as just a general sort of, okay, let's do this first before we try to figure out what we need to do if we have to do more things in a specific fashion due to a specific instance. Yeah. But, I mean, they're all good things. Uh, number one is being cleanse your space. The first thing you need to do is cleanse your space. And they're not just talking, like, spiritually. They're talking the physical act of cleaning your house top to bottom will actually help the situation. So, you know, getting out the vacuum, dusting the stuff down, give your house a good scrubbing, declutter it as well because energy gets trapped in dark, dirty, dark, cluttered spaces, which can attract uh, and sometimes produce low-level entities like shadow people. Right. Now, Because they want that chaos. Because typically, what do they say about a cluttered mind is a dangerous mind yeah. or whatever? That, well, I can't remember. That. Now, in addition to cleaning physically, a spiritual cleaning is a must. This can be done mul- multiple ways, but one of the most common and most effective is smudging. Uh, white sage works wonders to cleanse a space of negative energy and spirits. But do not forget, and I swear... Uh, it's a cultural thing, and I need to start encouraging it. You must open a window. That's This is saying open the windows. You oh. need to give <clears throat> the entity one exit point. I'd go one step further. Open any drawer. Because the, the way I was learned with this sort of thing a long time ago, yeah. all the doors open. Every room. Yeah. <clears throat> Cabinets open. Dresser drawers open. Anywhere that can be shut and closed and it's out of your sight is where this thing can hide. Closets. Open. Yeah. Chester drawers, open. Your dresser, open. Got a cast iron stove type thing, open that too. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere it can hide, open. Chimney. And then you got to have window open because it has to have a place to get out. You can't, you're just running around the room. Yeah. <laughs> you're running around your house. It has a place. You, you have to be able to eject it, right? And if you give it multiple exit points, this is, and again, this is a cultural thing because if I go back to like even like Hawaiian or Pacific Islander traditions and certain native and indigenous traditions, you only give it one exit point because if you give it too many, what happens is once you're done smudging, you've got to go run around and close all those real quick before it comes back in. Yeah, and if not all of it leaves because it can fracture itself or you just you kick yeah. in parts of the energy away, then there's still part left over. Yeah, so give it that one exit point. So, yeah. Now, the n- second um, piece of advice is to cleanse yourself. So just as you cleanse your space, you need to do your, the same for you. Um, this includes, you know, getting rid of built-up negative energy, Take a long herbal bath with purifying herbs, rosemary and lavender. Smudge yourself. Um, if that seems a little too folkish for you, take a good shower, meditate, clear your head, and then possibly still take the herbal bath. <laughs> yeah, smudge yourself. If you're going to smudge yeah. your house, smudge yourself. Yeah, and definitely give yourself a moment to just clear your head. So, yeah, get in the right frame yeah. of thinking. Which goes into number three, which is raise your vibrations, which I, I hate that statement, but it's true. You know, the best way to get rid of shadow people is to um, raise your energy and raise your train of thought. You know, um, 
I don't but, like the way they explain this. No, because they say, like, you can raise your vibrations by taking care of yourself, eating healthy, drinking lots of water, give up unhealthy habits. So basically self-care. <laughs> yeah. Be better with yourself, take care of yourself, love yourself, that kind of thing. Yeah. But the way I look at it is if you're raising your vibration, if, if you make a conscientious, conscientious effort to pull yourself out of this weakened state of mind, you know, where you're depressed or you're tired and you just, you know, the, the overall, and try to make an effort to be better, to be happier, to be brighter, that can work too. And and it doesn't say, but I think it should, make it clear when you're doing that self-care, I do not have room for these shadow people or whatever negative thing is going on. <clears throat> yeah, you got to make the intent known that whatever it is needs to go. Yeah. Because intention is huge. And so now they're saying, okay, if you've done all that sort of thing, let's, let's bring in some, some kind of spiritual protection. So you've cleansed your space, yourself, you're raising your vibrations. You know, how can you spiritually protect yourself? And of course, it depends on your original religion or you know, beliefs. You might use some like symbols, like sigils and things like that to ward off things. And sigils or symbols can, you know, take a couple different appearances. Like a lot of people wear the cross, runes if you're Viking or whatever. Because that seems to be cool now, right? Pagan, yeah. Yeah. Star of David, you know, something, you know, that because there's all sorts of, like, Catholics have lots of medallions and things like that. Just something that basically you have a little bit of faith in that you can use to help protect yourself. Yeah. Jewelry bearing your protective symbols uh, can be worn to get rid of shadow people. It also gives you that protective vibe. So anything that you consider, like, an amulet or is protective of your space, wear it, stitch it onto your jacket, present it or place it someplace important in your house yeah if you yeah. use stones or crystals or something like that you wear them yeah you know and if all else fails you might need to bring in some people hmm. you might need to bring in some kind of medium you might need to bring in somebody whether it's like a local religious person like a priest a pastor a medium a shaman a rabbi a reiki master and that's so that show that we do watch, uh, The Dead Files, um, the, the psychic medium on there, Amy, she always, one of the pieces of advice she commonly gives with shadow people is getting a Reiki person because a Reiki person has that healing energy and they're kind of kind of non-denominational. Yeah, they're working more with the, more with the energy than yeah. the Plus, intent behind it. Since the we don't it. know the origin of the shadow people, I kind of think that's a good idea, you know? Yeah. Because everything is energy, right? Yeah. So, you know, but those are a couple different things that we found on the internet that actually make sense. There's five different things to do. Do a recap on them if you want to get rid of them. And this says in four steps, but there's actually five steps. First thing is cleanse your space. Cluttered mind, cluttered area, all that sort of thing goes hand in hand. Clean things out. You know, and that's why a lot of people use the broom, right? Because you sweep out the spirits. You're sweeping out all that stuff. So you cleanse your space, cleanse yourself. Yep. Clean yourself, heart, mind, body, soul, right? Yeah. Take a bath and some delicious sea salts and stuff from Bath and Body Works. Not Bath and Body Works, more <laughs> yeah. like Etsy, okay? Yeah, somewhere <laughs> weird like that. I mean, you know, cleanse yourself. Raise your vibrations, change your way of thinking, make yourself more positive, that kind of thing. If you're positive and it's negative, if your positivity overrides the negative, what happens? Uh, there's no room for it. Yeah, yeah, there's no room for it. And if you always picture like... Like, let's use Harry Potter. Harry Potter was fighting the snake face guy. What was the snake face guy's name? Um, I don't know. The guy whose name shall not be named. Anyway, they got their two little stick wands, and they're fighting each other, and they got, like, you know, these, like, liquid water laser bolt spiritual beams coming out, and they're going back and forth, and one's green and one's red, and they're going back and forth, back and forth. But, you know, he elevated himself, and his his... his power became stronger and it went on down the beam and it blew up and the guy whose name who should not be named Waldemort's whatever his name's face and they see it's like that okay raise your vibration be stronger than what it is if you can or at least fake it yeah get yourself some spiritual protection you know whatever you put faith in use that stones amulets crosses star of david runes viking stuff whatever it is something that gives you strength gives you faith and then, and then call on some friends, man. Yeah. Find yourself a Reiki master. You may know somebody. You may know a spirit medium. You might have a priest, a pastor, a medium, a shaman, a rabbi, a rabbi something like that. Yep. Yeah. And that'll help get rid of shadow people. And I'm sure that works because that helps to get rid of a lot of things. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those things. It's like, so what do you do? And then, you know, the, if you're looking for other stuff that you might be able to do, there are other things out there. 
and because there's other articles and stuff, and some of the articles are a little bit different and come across uh, the idea of shadow people and what they stand for a little bit differently. You know, some people, if they purely believe it's ghost and spiritual, they're going to look at it as a different way. And some of them, if it's a uh, dimensional or interdimensional or really far out there, supernatural, they'll have very involved like rituals or processes you need to right. follow. And we're not out here to give you those instructions. Just the general guide is a, the best approach for somebody, unless you've been studying this for decades, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, if you're a skeptic, you know, and you got somebody coming to you, coming to you with the idea that a shadow person is not um, anything related to spiritual or non-spiritual, they may say it be, you know, it might be an issue of like sleep paralysis and things like that. Because you have these episodes, you may see something out of the corner of your eye. Sleep paralysis and hallucinations from sleep paralysis. All these problems can show up because of things like sleep paralysis, lack of sleep, Stress. or if you have schizophrenia. Yeah, stress. Yeah, stress. All these things sort of come together and manifest what you see, and it may not necessarily be a real thing. So then eliminate those or work on them the best you can. Yeah. You know? Now, if you try to eliminate all these things, if you try to eliminate shadow person, you do these things, and it's just not working, then you may need to sort of come to grips with the fact that this thing may not necessarily leave. You might, might think the idea of making a peace offering to it set some boundaries and see what happens and that kind of thing. But a lot of that that you read, if it comes to that sort of thing, is primarily based off the idea that this is some kind of ghost yeah. or jinn. So before you try to make peace with a shadow person and set your boundaries and do all that sort of thing, you might want to try to find out what kind of shadow person this thing may actually be. Yeah. Get a second opinion. Yeah. Because if you open the door and say, oh, you know, I'm going to offer myself up to you in an effort of peace, it may be causing more problems or it could cause more problems because you're surrendering to it. But if these things feed off energy and negative energy, like fear based energy, if you don't pay it any attention and no mind and you do these steps and your vibrations raise because you're less worried about it, you're not feeding it, chances are to go away. And it may just go away on its own. If it's a transitory thing, you know, sometimes a shift in season can make these things go away. But I will tell you this, stress is in every single one of these things as far as reasons as to why you might see it. Yeah. It's always stress. Stress is always there. So the first thing I would do would be try to remove or reduce stress. So there you go. Yeah. So anyway, that was our uh, Shadow People 101. Ooh, and if you have a Shadow People story, you should share it with us. Yes. Contact at creepgeeks.com, or you can call and tell your story, 575-208-4025. Yes, if you have any questions that we might be able to answer, shoot them to us. If we can't answer, we'll just say we don't know. Yeah. And, and maybe point you to someone who may know more than me, which is, you know, there's people that specialize in this kind of thing. And we have links to everything we talked about. Yep. So. Yeah. So just to do a real quick, real quick, I can't even talk, real quick recap. You got a couple different types of shadow people as we're putting them spiritual and everything else. You got different types of shadow people, whether they're there and in intent, feeding off power, or they don't care. They can have different appearances, creepers, crawlers, dark mass, black cloud, mist, may have eyes, may not have eyes, may be wearing clothes, can't necessarily say what they are, right? How do you get rid of them? Remove stress, the clutter, the clutter in your life. Clean, cleanse, and be more positive is really what it boils down to. So there you go. Now, if you want to ask us, have we ever seen shadow people? I have. Okay. You, I mean, okay. You're like, okay. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you see them, and sometimes I see zombies. Seen one last night. Really? Yep. Okay. I was up super late looking at the old TikToks. Minding my own business. That wasn't a zombie. That was uh, me waking up late to use the bathroom. Yep. Turned around and zombies in there shuffling around. But we should eventually possibly share those shadow people, uh, shadow people experiences. Yeah, I wasn't going to do it tonight, but I mean, yeah. yes, I have seen these things. So. Maybe on Patreon or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. 
There you go. Any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. But other than that, we're going to go ahead and leave you with uh, take it easy. Be careful. Raise your vibrations. Yeah. Cleanse yourself. And, uh, yeah, any questions that you have, if you think we can help, just let us know. But anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.